Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You are watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison for murdering George Floyd. Here's Floyd's seven-year-old daughter, Gianna. If you could say anything to your daddy right now, what would it be? It would be, I miss you and I love you. We are going to uh, work as hard as we can to continue our search and rescue effort. That is our priority. That is where we're focused. Rescue teams racing against the clock in Florida to find survivors of the deadly condo collapse in Surfside. And we're celebrating Pride Week in NYC with Jess King, the cult favorite Peloton instructor, here with her fiance, Sophia Urista, talking food, fitness, and pride. Where did you come from? What have you been through? How do you take your casserole? <laughs> I, Jess King, am championing for you to tell that story. We start the hour with Derek Chauvin sentencing NBC News correspondent Megan Fitzgerald is in Minneapolis. The prosecution had asked for 30 years. The defense asked for probation. Cahill gave Chauvin 22 and a half years. Tell us about Judge Cahill's decision today. You know, he started out, Allison, by saying he was going to be brief. Uh, he wanted to be very clear that this was not a decision made on politics. This was not a, a partisan decision in any way. He evaluated the facts uh, and then he came out with his sentence of 22 and a half years. Uh, you know, I think throughout this entire trial, uh, obviously emotions have been running high. It's been very publicized. Uh, so he didn't want to let on to any uh, indication that he in any way had any sort of bias. And it was very important for him to make that point uh, as he did, Allison. Uh, you're out there uh, at the scene of George Floyd's murder. I could see folks there behind you. Could you just describe what it was like there when, yeah. when the news broke about the sentencing? Yeah, absolutely. So George Floyd Square, obviously an important place for so many people over the last year and a half, because directly behind me here is where George Floyd died. Uh, this place has remained, uh, as many people have told me over the last several months, this is hollow ground. This is sacred ground. This is where they come to pay their respects uh, and to remember George Floyd's life. So certainly it was important for the people that you see gathered here today to come here for the sentencing. So we were there uh, the moment that uh, Judge Cahill delivered that sentence of 22 and a half years. And I got to tell you, you know, for some people, it wasn't enough. There were sighs. There was some disappointment. Of course, there were some people who said, you know, we'll, we'll take what we can get. Um, but I just talked to a woman a moment, ago, a moment ago, and she told me that, you know, why not the max? You know, he took a life. George Floyd will never walk these streets again. So some mixed emotions, but everyone here uh, watching closely, uh, trying to see what Judge Cahill would, would rule, Allison. Yeah, our legal analyst, Barbara McQuaid, agreeing as well that she thought it was a little bit on the low side, too. Megan, in the courtroom, we heard from Derek Chauvin's mother saying that she believes in his innocence yeah. and that she might never see her son again. Could you tell us more about that particular moment? Allison, you know, that was a very uh, compelling and, and certainly um, um, interesting moment, one that I don't think we all uh, expected. Uh, so you're hearing from his mother, um, you're hearing her humanize uh, Derek Chauvin, something that we've not really heard before, talking about how he um, was a good man, you know, and, and asking the judge not to sentence him for a long time, because uh, if so, he won't be able to see her uh, and, and uh, his father again. I want you to take a listen, though, to some of her words. Take a listen. It's been difficult for me to hear and read what the media, public, and prosecution team believe Derek to be an aggressive, heartless, and uncaring person. I can tell you that is far from the truth. My son's identity has also been reduced to that as, of, that as a racist. I want this court to know that none of these things are true and that my son is a good man. So 
also reinforcing the point that she was trying to make, and she said it several times, that her son is a good man, he's not a racist, uh, and that sentencing him is sentencing his family as well. Um, but I got to tell you, again, mixed emotions out here. Uh, people who've come in from across the country to be here for this moment, Allison, many people saying in some ways this is closure. This is the end. Uh, this is closure for the man who uh, actions led to George Floyd's death. Of course, we know that three other officers are going to be uh, standing trial in a couple of months here in, in March of next year. But for a lot of folks, uh, this is closure, Allison. Uh, Megan, I know the sentencing was the big headline today, but the judge also denied Derek Chauvin's motion for a new trial. Uh, how did he explain that? Well, essentially, basically saying that the defense did not provide enough evidence to suggest that he didn't get a fair trial. Uh, and so, you know, this is what we heard throughout the trial, the defense really pushing for, uh, trying to have moments of saying that it, it wasn't fair, wanting uh, the jury to be sequestered and all these things. But at the end of the day, the judge, as you said here, uh, made the decision ultimately that there was not enough evidence to suggest that Derek Chauvin didn't get a fair trial. So that was dismissed. All right, Megan Fitzgerald, you've been covering uh, th this case uh, for us throughout. Thank you so much uh, for being with us on Sentencing Day. Appreciate you. All right, let's bring in MSNBC legal analyst and former U.S. attorney Barbara McQuaid. Barbara, thanks for being with us on such an important day. Your reaction to Chauvin's sentence today, 22 and a half years, do you think that was appropriate? I, I do. I, I think it might have been a hair low. The sentencing guidelines in this case were 12 okay. to 15 months. But once the judge found those sentencing factors, those enhancements, he was permitted to double that range. So I expected something between 24 and 30 years, maybe a little closer to 24. But nonetheless, it's a, a long sentence. It's a strong sentence. And I think it does send a message of deterrence to other police officers. Barbara, Judge Cahill delivered his decision in writing 22 pages of legal analysis instead of just verbally to the court. Is that normal? It's not normal, but I think there's nothing normal about this okay. case. It is extraordinary. And so I yeah. think that he wrote that opinion outside of the presence of the stress and the lights of the courtroom when he was able to reflect soberly and decide the case on the law and the facts. And so I, I applaud him for, for doing that. He, he, in some ways, gave up his moment in the spotlight, uh, but in an effort to make sure that his decision is read and that perhaps uh, received with a reaction of emotion. George F Floyd's family gave some powerful victim statements today. Uh, here's his brother addressing Derek Chauvin. I wanted to know from the man himself why. What were you thinking? What was going through your head? When you had your knee on my brother's neck. How much do statements like this, questions like this, impact uh, a judge's final decision? I don't know that they impacted an awful lot. I think, you know, the, the fact that uh, the judge here was able to issue his 22-page opinion uh, 15 minutes after he heard all of this does indicate that he had written yeah. most of it in advance. But nonetheless, I think it does uh, bring home the loss of George Floyd. And I think it's very important for the judge to hear it. I think it's also important for Derek Chauvin to hear it and for the public to hear it, uh, to recognize yeah. that a member of our society has been lost and the impact that has on those who knew him and loved him. Judge Cahill also denied Chauvin's motion for a new trial. Chauvin spoke very, very briefly today. Here's that moment. I uh, do want to give my condolences to the Floyd family. Um, there's going to be some other information in the future that would be of interest. And uh, I hope things will give you some, some peace of mind. What do you think about his decision to speak briefly today? A smart move ahead of his uh, appeal? Uh, is that how you would say he, he should have played this? Well, he's in a little bit of a diff difficult position because he is facing criminal charges yeah. from the federal government as well. So anything he says could be used against him. But um, you know, offering condolences to the family, I think, was good. 
I would have liked to see him go a little further and show remorse. Uh, you know, he 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 expressed yeah. condolences in the same way I might express condolences. But uh, we, it's a fact right. that George Floyd died at the hands of Derek Chauvin, whether he intended it or not. And so I, I think I would, if I had been giving him legal advice here, I would have counseled him to uh, to share a little bit of remorse. That's what I was always looking for as a prosecutor, and I think that's what judges are looking for mm -hmm. in imposing a sentence. To the extent Judge Hill was holding, Judge Cahill was holding back and making a decision what his final number would be, I think that lack of remorse may have weighed into that decision. Yeah, let me ask you more about that, a little bit more emotion, perhaps some sort of expression of sorrow that, that you think could have potentially made a difference here? I think an expression of remorse. That is always the thing that uh, I thought mattered at the time of sentencing. Uh, does the person show contrition? You know, when we think about the purpose of criminal law, it has a number of different factors. Uh, one of them is promoting respect for the rule of law, uh, showing yeah. just punishment for wrongdoing, um, you know, not just public safety and deterrence for this person and others. And so some sense of I know what I did was wrong, I think uh, shows that the person is already on their way to that sort of rehabilitation and could help diminish the sentence. But when they fail to show that kind of remorse, then I think uh, a judge feels the need to impose a longer sentence. Barbara, uh, such an important day. We were watching for that sentencing, uh, waiting uh, for the, that, uh, that time this afternoon. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be with us. Great. Thanks. We've got the resources. We've got the manpower. We just need a little bit of luck now. Search and rescue teams not giving up, still looking for signs of life in the Surfside, Florida condo collapse. So far, four people have died, 159 still missing. That search now in day two. NBC News reporter Vaughn Hilliard is there. Uh, Vaughn, officials still hopeful that they will find survivors. Uh, what's the latest on their search? We, the number of 159 unaccounted individuals has not changed since 8 a.m. this morning out here in the Miami area. Uh, that's a number that is very tough to grapple with is these family members and friends who have been leaving here from the reunification center here throughout the day. Uh, they are having a tough time because no news uh, is not good news. And with every passage of time, uh, it just makes the likelihood of survivability all the more or less, especially after a tough day like today, uh, in which there has been about six different rainstorms uh, over the course of a few minutes that have slammed into these areas, making it particularly tough for, for these rescue crews. Uh, these families, Allison, they have actually been moved from, they're in the process of being moved here from this reunification here to a hotel just a couple of blocks down the road here uh, as they prepare for a sustained uh, longer term outlook here, Allison. Uh, Vaughn, I absolutely can't imagine what these families are going through. Uh, what kind of updates are they getting? What kind of information are, get are they getting? And how on earth are they keeping their hope alive today? Yeah, Allison, for the last 24 hours, this was the reunification center here, just less than a mile away from where that condo collapsed. But they were just here this afternoon, moved down the road a couple blocks to a hotel where they actually just met with local officials, uh, police officials, as well as Governor DeSantis, where uh, in a private meeting with those families who are understandably uh, ever the more impatient and, uh, and fearing the worst for their loved ones, uh, beneath that rubble, uh, the governor uh, providing uh, information to these folks that they are going to get constant updates over the course of you know every four hours at least, but also for these families here, uh, the assurance that they are with them through the long haul. They've put them up into these hotel rooms uh, and they said that they are there because it's becoming ever more apparent that this is not going to be a process in which many of these people know about their loved ones in the days ahead, but potentially weeks ahead, Allison. Oh, well, it's absolutely heartbreaking and such a tough story, but but they've got hope. We've got hope. Maybe we'll get some miracles here. Thank you so much for your reporting. Thanks, my friend. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce. She's got the latest headlines from NBCNews.com. Hey, Simone. Hey, Allison, we start with rising tensions in the Black Sea. Russia is accusing Britain and the United States of inciting conflict in what Russia says are its territorial waters, adding it would defend its borders using all possible means, including military force. Earlier this week, Russia claims it fired warning shots at a British destroyer ship off the coast of Crimea. Now, Britain denies those claims. 
Well, parts of Sydney are going into lockdown following a COVID-19 outbreak there with about 65 cases of the highly contagious Delta variant. Authorities are urging people to only leave their homes for essential purposes. Australian states also closed their borders to anyone from parts of Sydney or New South Wales. And gamers beware, hackers are hiding malware called Krakenosh in free versions of popular games like NBA 2K19, Grand Theft Auto, and The Sims. Once installed, this malware uses the computer's processing power to mine crypto. Since 2018, it's mined about $2 million worth of the cryptocurrency Moreno. And for the first time in 15 months, a cruise ship will set sail from the U.S. The Celebrity Edge, a Royal Caribbean cruise brand, will board passengers at Fort Lauderdale for a seven-night voyage. According to the cruise line, at least 95% of passengers and 98% of staff are fully vaccinated. And Conan O'Brien taking a final bow on TBS last night. I think when smart and stupid come together, it's very difficult, but if you can make it happen, I think it's the most beautiful thing in the world. Well, O'Brien bid farewell to his show, Conan, with a star-studded episode. The former Late Night and Tonight Show host will now turn his attention towards a new weekly variety series airing on HBO Max. End of an era there, and I guess the beginning of a new one. Allison, I'll send it back to you. Totally smart. I'm such a fan. I'm totally team Coco, especially because they just blur smart and stupid. I think it's the best thing about them. Thank you so much. <laughs> The Trump Organization could be hit with criminal charges next week. Several people familiar with the matter telling NBC News those charges are coming from Manhattan DA Cy Vance in a case tied to tax evasion. NBC News investigations correspondent Tom Winter joining us now from 30 Rock. So, Tom, uh, what have you learned today? So, Allison, a couple of things. One, as you said, the charges expected to be filed next week, and they're criminal charges against the organization itself. So it's not specific to any one individual, although it is quite likely and, and almost a certainty that certain individuals will be named. And so, according to Trump's attorneys, who, by the way, have called this, com quote, completely outrageous, uh, they their belief on it, after meeting with prosecutors for the Manhattan District Attorney's Office yesterday, Allison, is that it centers around a series of benefits that are paid out, and then they, those benefits were not properly documented in tax returns. What are we talking about? We're talking about uh, the use of a company car, the use of a company apartment, and then giving that to somebody and not including it on their tax returns. That's what they say they believe it's about after meeting with eight or nine prosecutors from Vance's office yesterday and getting the word that those charges are expected to come down. We don't know the specific timing next week, and we don't know whether or not it's going to be more expansive than that or not. But that's the, base, that's the heart of it at this point. Of course, all of this stems from a case that you and I have talked about extensively in an investigation we've talked about extensively, going back from the battle for Trump's taxes that wound, winded its way through the Supreme Court not once but twice and leading up to what appear to be the first criminal charges in this case sometime next week. Uh, so, Tom, I can imagine how the Trump organization is responding, uh, but, uh, but I'll let you give us their formal reply. <laughs> sure. Well, the first line from Ron Fischetti, who's uh, the attorney uh, for the Trump organization, he says it looks like they are going to come down. He's re referring to the charges. Um, and he said it is completely outrageous. He says it hurts a lot of innocent people who are working at that company, and they are doing this just to get back at Donald Trump, um, among other uh, numerous other statements that he made uh, as far as the investigators and the in investigation goes. Uh, they're obviously not happy about what's occurred. Uh, the Trump family uh, apparently uh, communicating to their attorney uh, that the president himself, uh, former president himself, is quite angry about this possibility sometime next week. All right, Tom Winter, thank you so much for reporting today. I appreciate you. Sure thing. President Biden nearing the finish line on a big bipartisan infrastructure bill. Uh, but it looks like they may be running into some early trouble there. Republicans not happy uh, about what the president said yesterday, uh, that he wanted both uh, this bipartisan bill and reconciliation as well. Meanwhile, at the White House, Biden's meeting with Afghan President Ashraf Ghani as the U.S. withdraws its troops from Afghanistan. NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba is in Washington, D.C. Monica, our Cap Hill team reporting that Republicans are not happy, particularly with the president's comments that he won't sign the bipartisan infrastructure bill unless he also gets reconciliation tying the two together. What's the White House saying today about keeping this fragile deal alive? 
That commitment from the president, Allison, absolutely did ruffle some feathers. And so in today's White House press briefing, the press secretary was asked, has this deal already hit a pothole since we're all into infrastructure puns right now? And she said, no, absolutely not, that this mm -hmm. is really something where the White House wants to be focused on what they perceive as an absolute victory yesterday, given this handshake agreement on the bipartisan framework. But yes, absolutely. There is a concern now because Republicans have said they don't like the fact that the president is tying these two things together. But the White House says that was the plan all along, even though the president maybe hadn't said it as explicitly, that he wanted them to pursue these two tracks. Take a listen to how Jen Psaki responded to this specifically. One is the significant economic impact. It's going to help create millions of good paying union jobs. It will also have a huge impact on low income communities, on communities of color. I'll also note there are huge components of this package that will help address the climate crisis. There's no question there's work ahead and he's ready to roll up his sleeves and work like hell to get it done. Jen Psaki was also asked in this briefing, though, what the timeline would look like and how this would work if the bipartisan framework came to his desk first. Would he absolutely need the budget reconciliation process to be there on the same day, or is he willing to, again, be a little bit flexible? And she said, again, quite emphatically, she will not sign one without the other. And as far as what we can expect in terms of how long this is going to take, Allison, it's going to stretch well into the summer, potentially not wrapping up until somewhere in the September time frame. Monica, I understand the president also had a call today with Senator Kirsten Sinema. Can you tell us what that was about? What do you know? This stood out to us because we also wanted to know who initiated this call. And based on the White House readout, yeah. the word reiterate was in there a lot of times. So this seemed to be, is this a senator who was a little bit concerned again about the president's own words and vow yesterday? But the White House says that, no, this was a call that both sides wanted to have and that the president was happy to reiterate to Senator Cinema that this was something that they could do and that she apparently, according to the White House elite, at least agreed with that and that she was OK to see both of these things occurring in their words in tandem. So we'll have to see whether all the other senators can do this because, again, we've talked about this so much, Allison. Of course, now the president is happy. He campaigned on bipartisanship. But can he keep his own party together? That's a whole nother challenge because Democrats may not be able to agree on the size and scope of the budget reconciliation. If Republicans are upset about this other thing, then yes, fragile is the word to describe this deal that yesterday they were very happy about. But that still has a very steep uphill climb to go. And Monica, quickly before you go, I know President Biden was meeting with the Afghan president. What do we know about that, that meeting today? And this is significant on a couple of fronts. Of course, we know that the president has vowed to withdraw troops from Afghanistan before the 20th anniversary of the September 11th attack. So we know that's going to be taking place quite soon. But then there's a huge question about all of these Afghan nationals who were so helpful to the U.S. over the last two decades, of course, and what happens to them. So we now know that under some special immigrant visas, many of them are going to be relocated, but we don't have the specifics on how many and to where or or when he, whether any of them will be coming to the United States. But we know that that was a topic of discussion, in addition to COVID vaccines, which the U.S. has also pledged to Afghanistan at this point, Allison. All right, Monica Alba, uh, with a wrap-up of everything happening at the White House today. Thanks so much. Being in Guatemala, being in Mexico, talking with Mexico as a partner, frankly, on the issue, was about addressing the causes. And then coming to the border at the, at the advice and, the, and actually the, the invitation of the Congresswoman uh, is about looking at the effects of what we have seen happening in Central America. And um, so I'm glad to be here. It was always the plan to come here. Vice President Harris touring a Border Patrol facility in El Paso, Texas today, seeing the migrant situation there firsthand. NBC News correspondent Jacob Soboroff is there. Allison, Vice President Harris came here to El Paso uh, because it's the place that the family separation policy started under the Trump administration. And, and the administration, the Biden administration, believes that this is a place where they can lean into their message of pivoting away from what they call the cruelty of that administration to what they hope will be a fair, safe, humane, and orderly immigration system that they would like to create. But they're being criticized both on the right and on the left for this visit and the policies that remain in place from the Trump administration. Vice President Harris spoke to reporters uh, and at her stops along the way here in El Paso earlier. This is what she said. When we have this conversation about what's happening at the border, 
let's not lose sight of the fact that we're talking about human beings. And so let's recognize with a sense of humanity that these issues must be addressed in a way that is informed by fact and informed by reality. Those criticisms on the right are about coming here to El Paso and not the Rio Grande Valley, where the vast majority uh, of apprehensions occur. But that is not new. That's a historical fact, and it continues to be true uh, to this day. And she's being criticized on the left uh, for not moving fast enough towards that humane system that this administration has said they want to create, including rolling back that Title 42 policy. Uh, it is a COVID um, CDC order that has barred, uh, expelled most people trying to uh, come into the country and declare asylum. And advocates who the vice president also is meeting with while she's on the ground here say it has been far too long for that policy to be in place. There is no basis in public health and lives are being harmed because of that policy. The administration wants people on the left to believe that they are moving away from that Trump administration cruelty towards migrants and particularly asylum seeking families and children. Uh, but there are a lot of policy oriented issues, most importantly, that Title 42. Uh, that folks on the left are almost strange bedfellows uh, with the right in criticizing this administration over immigration policy. To be sure, the right wants a return to Trump administration policies uh, like uh, the majority expulsions, like the Remain in Mexico policy, and for some, including Marjorie Taylor Greene, even a return to the family separation policy. Certainly that is not what the administration is here to talk about. Uh, and they are trying to chart a new course and a new path, and that is where and why uh, Vice President Harris showed up here to El Paso for her first visit to the southwest border uh, since becoming the Vice President of the United States. Now back to Surfside, Florida. MSNBC anchor Ali Velshi is there. He joins me now. Uh, Ali, uh, just an unbelievable risk that rescuers there are taking. They're searching beneath piles of rubble, what's left of this building. Uh, what's the latest in the building's stability? What can you tell us about their search for survivors today? And wonderful to see you, my friend. And you, I'm sorry, it's always under circumstances like these. I just actually watched a couple of dozen uh, urban search and rescue workers go in. Uh, it's been hampered by weather a little bit. It's been very rainy around here. The rain itself doesn't stop the workers from working. There is some, uh, there was some lightning in the area last night. That did delay them. But fundamentally, it makes the job harder because they are in a building where they don't understand what caused it. So they don't understand the parts that are remaining uh, standing, how stable they are. Uh, a, a part of this building has pancakes. So there's literally no space between the floors. So uh, firefighters are looking for, and, and other rescue workers, are looking for voids, air spaces where people might be. They're using sonar. They're using cameras. They're using infrared. They're using dogs. They're listening uh, for, for cries from people. But it has not been a, a very successful day so far. Overnight, we learned that four people uh, have been killed in this so far. And, but the number of people unaccounted for has now risen to 159. Now, the mayor of Miami-Dade County was clear to say that the 159 doesn't mean that they believe there are 159 people uh, in that building. It means that those are the people they cannot take off the list who they think might have been there, who might have been residents, who might have been renting a place there, might have been visiting. They've not been able to take those people off the list. And all day, that number has not come down. It's only gone up. It was 99 last night. Now it's 159. So workers have worked through the night. They only stop when there is lightning. Uh, but it is slow going because they don't know, they don't want to do something thing that causes uh, an airspace or a void to cave in. Then they've got their own safety to, to look after. So you can look at these pictures. It is remarkable. It is very dangerous. But we look again right behind me. If we could just put the, you know, well, you'll see it in a second. There's still more people coming in. You see the the, the um, tools and the implements that they're carrying with them, the helmets. Yeah. They are ready to go in there. And there has been an influx of people, food trucks, volunteers, cars coming in, people bringing uh, water. So uh, people are praying and they are trying to help. But it is slow going. Yeah. And Ali, I understand they've been bringing in dogs too, right? Because I think one question so many of us has have had, how do you know the difference between maybe rubble shifting, maybe rock shifting, maybe the building settling, and then a sound or a sign that you've actually got a living person under there? And I, I understand that the dogs are very helpful yeah. with that as well. Right. So because it's loud, right? It's it's loud. It's been bad weather. There's rain, yeah. there's wind, there's helicopters, there's machinery. Um, so it becomes very hard. So traditionally, and this, this is very reminiscent of the search after 9-11, where if there is a, a sort of a noise that anybody identifies, they everybody goes silent for a little while. You'll see a lot of dogs in the imagery uh, trying to, you know, hear, trying to smell. Uh, it, it becomes very, very hard to determine what's what. So the fire chief, in answer to that question, was saying, 
doing. They are combining resources. They're using that sonar. They're using cameras. They're using dogs. They're using listening. And they're trying to map it out on a grid system to say, where is it likely that there is a space that people might be? And that's how they're going at it. Some of it is just hand to hand. They're literally moving bricks and bulk and, and, and things into wheelbarrows and taking it away. So there's a lot of it that's high tech. And there's some of it that is very uh, old fashioned, low tech, just people getting in there, risking their lives to try and find people alive in that rubble. Yeah, Ali, you said high tech and then also basic things like prayers, right? We're all praying that, that the incredible work they're yes. doing may, may save some lives, may get some folks out of there alive. Thanks so much for your reporting. And hey, maybe next time it'll be under better circumstances. Yeah, let's hope. It's time for the bottom line, our daily look at what's going on in the business world and beyond. It's Friday, so you know what that means. Our friend Caleb Silver, editor-in-chief at Investopedia, is here. Uh, Caleb, the market's finishing this week on a pretty high note. The S&P put up its best week since February. The Dow, not too bad either. It put up nearly 240 points today, so we've got some positives there. But Bitcoin, the meme stocks took a hit. So tell me what's going on in this battle between traditional stocks, meme stocks, crypto. Uh, what was the word this week? Yeah, right. and, and investors just shook off inflationary concerns. They shook off concerns about whether or not this infrastructure bill will pass. They're like Taylor Swift, just shaking off all the walls of worry that they've been facing all year. The S&P 500 up 2.5% uh, this week. The Dow up 3.5%. We're up 14% for the year for the broader market, Allison. So investors just keep pushing stocks higher. Multiple records uh, for the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ this week. And the meme stock mania is cooling a little bit finally. We still see some activity around some of the most popular stock, but searches for those stocks and people trading in those stocks and betting against them has really cooled down a bit. And the same thing has happened in cryptocurrency, where Bitcoin is now down 45 percent from its all-time highs. Just a few weeks ago, it seems like investors are coming back to the fundamentals, looking at the economy, looking at the expansion and saying, we're going to get some more government spending here. And government spending and low interest rates, that's a really good recipe for the stock market. Sure is, Caleb. All right, we've got concerns about inflation across the nation. Everything seems more expensive right now, from gas and groceries to used cars, new homes. We got some fresh data today. Uh, what's it saying about prices? What should people know here? Yeah, we did get the PCE, the Personal Consumption Expenditures Report. This is actually the one that the Federal Reserve cares about because this includes everything, all the goods and services that we buy, plus gas, plus food, you know, the things we actually spend money on, up 3.4% yeah. from a year ago. <laughs> biggest rise, biggest rise, Allison, since April of 1992. Now, we're coming off a very low base last wow. year when prices collapsed, but we're getting these big surges in almost everything. But you're starting to see some softness now, too, in the commodity cycle, lumber prices are finally coming down. Copper prices are finally coming down. Coffee prices are finally okay, coming good. down. Cereal prices almost Thank there. Goodness. So you're seeing it. You're seeing a turnover a little bit here, but you still see very high prices. The Federal Reserve insists this is only here for a trans transitory period of time, as I like to call it. We'll have to see about that because everything everybody buys these days, much more expensive. And consumer spending, Allison, slowed from May to April because we're not getting those stimulus checks anymore and things are more expensive. So you're seeing that spending being reined in by consumers right now. Yeah, we're spending less because coffee costs so darn much and we need it to get through the day. Uh, Caleb, the summer might be here, but we still have a lot going on. Uh, what's on deck next week? Well, next week, we're going to be looking again at the housing market. It has been red hot. As you know, Allison, home prices are up some 20% yeah. year over year in some cities, even more than that. Take a Phoenix, take a San Diego. So next year, we're going to be, next week, we're going to be looking at the Case Shiller home price index. That tricks the 20 biggest cities around the country for home prices. We know those prices have been surging. Phoenix, San Diego, Las Vegas, that sunbelt down there, the Southwest. A lot of folks are moving there and prices are still very high. Existing home sales also coming out next week. That's important because folks that have a home trying to sell into this hot market. Not so easy these days because prices are so high right now. Also, next week is the big June jobs report. We are not adding jobs at the rate we thought we would be at this point in the recovery. We'll see if that's yeah. the case again for the June jobs report because folks aren't going back to work. The labor force participation rate remains very low for this point in the recovery. Yeah, we're really going to be watching that June jobs report next week, Caleb, and we'll look forward to talking to you about it. Have a great weekend. In the meantime, we'll see you next week. Thank you, Allison. Good to see you. They are calling him Lord of the Roths, Roth IRA, that is. A new ProPublica investigation says billionaire investor Peter Thiel has turned a retirement account for the middle class into a $5 billion tax-free piggy bank. If you don't know who he is, he's one of the founders of PayPal. All right, just think about that. 
ProPublica is saying that if every one of the 2.3 million people in Houston, Texas, put $2,000 in a bank today, those bank accounts still wouldn't equal what Teal has in his Roth IRA. I wish my retirement accounts looked that good. Now, NBC News has not independently verified these documents, and, and ProPublica isn't accusing Teal of doing anything illegal. But man, this one's fascinating, isn't it? ProPublica reporter Justin Elliott uh, is one of the folks on this investigation. Justin, uh, I'm a former biz reporter. I'm the daughter of a CPA, so you can imagine I'm real into this. I got a lot of questions for you. Uh, Roth <laughs> IRAs, or individual retirement accounts, are for people who, this year, for people who make less than 140 k a year, and most people are capped at putting in 6000 I can't even invest in a Roth. So how do a billionaire like Teal open one of these? And then how do you get around that annual investment cap to grow it to $5 billion? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Those are those are uh, exactly the right two questions. So uh, when he opened this Roth, uh, which was back in 1999, uh, he was actually making he was not yet a billionaire. He was making under the income cap back then, uh, partly because he was working at a tech startup. And as you know, uh, often these startups pay low salaries and instead give people equity. Um, but in many ways, yeah. the more interesting question is, how, uh, how did he grow the account so large when back then the uh, the contribution cap of how much money you could put into one of these accounts was just $2,000. And what our reporting found yeah. is that Teal actually purchased uh, over a million shares of the company that would become PayPal um, when they were not yet public, and the shares were priced at just a tenth of a penny each. Um, so that was sort of the extremely low base upon which he grew this $5 billion Roth. Well, that's the way to do it, it seems. Uh, but listen, he's not alone, right? You're reporting uh, Warren Buffett, one of the richest men in the world, a vocal supporter of higher taxes on the ri rich, also makes use of a Roth. And that at the end of 2018, Buffett had $20.2 million in it. Have Warren Buffett or Teal talked to you about what they're doing? Have you gotten any response from them or their teams? Um, actually, neither of them responded to us, but um, a, a, another person, Ted Weschler, who's one of the top executives actually at Berkshire Hathaway, works uh, under Warren Buffett, um, has an even larger Roth account than Buffett. It's uh, over $250 million. And he sent us a long statement uh, saying that uh, his, his large account was the result of, of luck and good investment decisions. But he actually also said something more interesting, which is that he, he thinks this policy should be changed. I mean, the original reason uh, why the government, Congress, uh, created this tax-free account was to incentivize ordinary middle-class people to save for retirement. Uh, it was not to create a vehicle where the ultra-wealthy, you know, people who are literally billionaires in some cases, could just uh, have a, a tax-free account uh, to do their normal investing with. It's really deviated quite far from its original purpose. Yeah, sure has. I know some lawmakers have, have tried to do something about it, but didn't get very far. Maybe they'll take another look. It was a fantastic and fascinating report. Thank you so much for talking to us about it. Thanks so much. If the words purple hat dance, ooh, mommy, fairy fury, or the letters J-K-E mean anything to you, I think you know who my next guests are. If not, you are in for a treat. One of my absolute favorite Peloton instructors, she's got a cult following, Jess King, and her fabulous fiance, singer Sophia Arista. It is Pride Weekend in New York City. I cannot think of two better representatives of New York's LGBTQ and Latinx communities. Ladies, thank you for being here. Happy Pride. Thank you for having Happy us. Pride. Thanks for having us, Allison. We're so excited to be here. I love it. All right, so Jess, let me start with you. I took your big free to ride this morning, and I love that you said she's an artist who's gay, not a gay artist. What's your message for young people, young women who might be struggling with their sexual identity, their gender identity, trying to find their community and a place in this world as a young LGBTQ plus person? What would you say to them? Sure. I mean, I think the focus should be on love and finding a partnership, no matter what the gender of either of you are, to focus on finding someone who's going to love you and a love that's going to heal you. I mean, you want to feel safe. You want to feel seen. You want to feel celebrated in your partnership. And for me, I had always been in heterosexual relationships before I met Sophia. I was immediately drawn to her energy. And I was also in the process of manifesting or cultivating love in my life. And I focused on the way I wanted to feel in that relationship. And when I finally felt that way, it showed up as a 
woman, I said, yeah, I totally and fully accepted it because it felt good. So, Sophia, let me ask you uh, about umami, where you two cook, you share your love for each other and Jess's love of chips. Uh, why did you want to welcome people into your home and to your kitchen uh, in, in such an intimate way? Well, I, the pandemic was a way, was a, a time where everybody was cooking all the time. <laughs> I mean, how many loaves of bread did everybody yeah. <laughs> make last year? Um, but it was a time where, you know, we really were missing our community and we were honestly missing being like intimate with each other, going on dates, being with our friends. We didn't have that. So we sort of recreated that by doing the cooking show. We could interact with others, interact with each other in our favorite way, which is eating and cooking. Totally. And a oh, big you question. Crack, get, you crack me up. I love it. A big question that I get from my audience is what do you eat? What do you eat? So this is a way of being creative and, and bringing them into our home to show them what it is that we actually eat and share with them recipes and also our perspective around food, which leans more towards nourishment and not necessarily a restrictive diet in any way. So uh, I love that. And I love that this is part uh, of your your whole Peloton vibe. I have to tell you, the Jess King experience absolutely kept me sane and in shape during this pandemic. You infuse all of your classes with positivity, inclusivity. I love that you stress that it's about being strong, not skinny. Can we talk about the connection between physical and mental health? It's such a core part of your classes. Totally. I believe that we have a physical intelligence and oftentimes our fear and our ego and our psyche gets in the way. And before I make any big decisions, before I try and understand what's going on around me, I focus on what's going on within me. So I always say move first, figure the rest out later. Um, when you're in a workout, you shake up the energy inside of your body. And I feel like you can hear, at least I can start to hear what's more true. And plus you feel so empowered in a workout and that stays with you throughout the day and no one can take that away from you. So I think it is one of our most important resources that we have access to at all times. And it doesn't just need to be a workout. You can dance, you can shake it out. You can do something that makes you excited, yeah. but it's about moving the energy in your body so that you can hear and feel what is more true for you. Whatever you do, you just got to put your whole ass in it, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. We don't half ass anything around here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, one last request before I let you ladies go. Uh, if you've never seen uh, on her Instagram, Jess King NYC, Jess does something we absolutely love called Fairy Fury. Can we get a little Fairy Fury next week? I'm dying for it. Yes, absolutely. I slipped up the last few weeks, got busy, but it is such a fun part of my day to go out there. And, you know, it's a, it's a something that we all share running late, right? So it's a way to find a sense of humor and humanity and be able to root for people to make it because those ferry captains, man, they were on a tight ship. You miss that boat. That's it. You got to wait for the next one. So um, absolutely. Just for you. Oh, thank you. I love that you have so much faith in all those folks who are, you know, <laughs> flopping around trying to get there as quick as they can. You're always so encouraging. Jess and Sophia, thank you uh, for your amazing energy and for being with us and, and have a terrific Pride weekend. I uh, hope everyone celebrates and has some fun. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Happy Pride, everyone. Britney Spears on a private jet laughing with her boyfriend, Sam Asghari. Have I ever told you I love broccoli? The lighthearted videos posted to his social media. The pop star posting on her own account a more serious message to her fans. I apologize for pretending like I've been okay the past two years. I did it because of my pride and I was embarrassed to share what happened to me. The 39-year-old lashed out in court on Wednesday, comparing life under her conservatorship to human trafficking. If I didn't do any of my meetings and work 10 hours a day, seven days a week, I wouldn't be able to see my kids or my boyfriend. Brittany told the judge she wants to sue her father and everyone involved, saying they should be in jail. Let Brittany speak! The hashtag free Brittany going viral. Podcast host Tess Barker is a leader in the movement. The moment that really keeps making my blood boil was when she told the court that her conservators weren't allowing her to go to the doctor to get her IUD removed. I think that's an issue of 
civil rights, bodily autonomy. But legal experts say it's not unusual for conservators to control a patient's contraception because their psychotropic medicine could harm a fetus, noting we still don't have all the facts in this case. Incredibly, Brittany also told the court she didn't know she could petition to end her 13-year conservatorship, something her older brother Brian says she's been asking for. She's wanted to get out of it for quite some time. Her attorney has not helped her to that end. How is that possible? It would result in a mini trial in front of the world, essentially, including her medical records, expert testimony, diagnoses. Brittany told the judge she wants to replace her court-appointed attorney and hire her own counsel, a move her mother Lynn advocated for. But Brittany says she feels totally alone. My family has lived off my conservatorship for 13 years. I won't be surprised if one of them says, we don't think this should end. Flight attendants learning how to fight back. Federal air marshals will start teaching them self-defense again to deal with all the unruly post-pandemic passengers. NBC News aviation correspondent Tom Costello has the story. Hey, Allison, good day. So a lot of veteran flight attendants and executives think that we are seeing this pent up anger over the pandemic, post pandemic anger boiling over in airports and also on planes. A lot of it has to do with the mask mandate and a lot of the violence has been directed against flight attendants. Now Homeland Security is training flight attendants in self-defense and how to fight back. I need everyone to take their seats right now. It's gotten so bad at 30,000 feet. The TSA says federal air marshals will once again start teaching self-defense to flight crews, a program suspended because of the pandemic. They're treating us like punching bags, whether that's verbally or physically. We have never seen this level of aggression or conflict on our planes, and we really need some help. So far this year, the FAA says it has nearly 3,100 reports from the airlines of unruly passengers. The vast majority, more than 2,300, involve people who refuse to comply with the federal mask mandate. We have the safest aviation system in the world, and we want to make sure that, uh, that it stays that way. We've seen the incidents on the ground and in the air. We the people! And as air travel edges closer and closer to pre-pandemic levels, a number of these cases have involved attacks on crew members, including a recent Southwest flight attendant in California who lost two teeth when assaulted by a passenger. Interfering with the flight crew is a federal offense and could result in jail time. These events of unruly passengers are way out of control, way over the top. In fact, so much that if it continues at this rate, it's going to be more than we have had in the entire history of aviation just in this year alone. So far, the FAA has levied half a million dollars in fines. Jail time can follow. Banned for life by that airline that the passenger is on when the incident occurred. And the FAA mask mandate remains in effect until mid-September. Hey, NBC News viewers. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here. And click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.